Bill, talk to me a little bit about how do the trade tensions actually affect your business. Yeah, so far, not so much. And we're, we're hopeful that that continues for some time. But for us, the, uh, the U.S.-China trade is a relatively small proportion of our overall income. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's keep in mind that the trade hasn't actually reduced very materially between U.S. and China, and trade within the, the Asian region uh, is still very strong. Uh, we could say even that the more the tensions go up between U.S. and China, the more the trade between China and the rest of the region will increase, both because the Chinese goods are going to find an outlet, but also because the supply chains are being reconfigured. So uh, more and more of the, the investment from uh, international companies who are eventually exporting back to the U.S. is being rooted outside of China, but also Chinese companies are rooting their supply chain outside of China in order to, uh, to avoid the, the impact of sanctions overall. Uh, given that, that, that we operate in every Asian country, uh, in every South Asian country, in, in 11 countries in, uh, in, uh, in, in Africa, across the Middle East, and another uh, 15 countries across the region from, a, from an offshore perspective, this, these are our markets. And as these supply chains reconfigure, uh, this, this should be a good thing for us in the right. medium to long term. And in the short term, of course, we're all very concerned about how these, these, uh, uh, the, this trade tension escalates. Uh, but you're still confident that you are able to deliver this 5 to 7 percent income growth over the next we are. three years, right? We are. So uh, it doesn't actually have, uh, impact anything right now. Yeah. I, I, like, we're going to watch very carefully at the, at the economic impact of these rising tensions. So, so we, we feel a, sl a sluggishness and an overall heaviness in the global economy right now. Mm -hmm. Some of that is cyclical. Uh, Maybe it was going to happen otherwise. Some of that is on the back of, of concerns that these trade tensions or technology tensions could become much more severe. So the, 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 the economic impact is real. Um, we're seeing signs of that. Uh, in terms of the, the, the flow of, of trade, it's going to change most likely on the back of, of this escalation, uh, but not necessarily in a bad way for us. How do you see the world economy right now? Or do, do you worry about a downturn <coughs> or is it we do. wait and see mode? Well, we're always worried. I, mean, I think we're, we're, we're paid to worry. Uh, and, and, and I, but I do worry about the heaviness in, in the world economy right now. We're seeing downgrades consistently. Uh, various estimations from, from our economists, from other economists, around the, the impact of a further escalation in, uh, in U.S.-China tensions. Uh, and you know, you're looking at global economic growth now that's below potential. Uh, for the first, in terms of forecasts, for the first time in a few years, uh, Chinese growth is, is is feeling a bit of pressure, and U.S. growth is, is showing some signs. The consumer is very strong, mm -hmm. uh, which is good. Like, let's be clear, the U.S. economy is still very strong, uh, but there's a pressure, uh, and, and a downward pressure but that wasn't there even even uh, two or three months ago. Well, how does that change your job and what you're focusing on for the bank? So we're, we're building our bank for the long term. We're oh. extremely well capitalized. We're very liquid. Uh, we're investing quite heavily in, in a number of themes. Uh, we're betting on the ongoing opening up of China, uh, which is happening. It's happening from day to day. Now, the opening up may be directed more at other parts of Asia and less at the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, depending on how things unfold. Uh, we're still hopeful that there's a resolution to the U.S.-China tensions. But on the assumption that there's not, which is the base case, right? I think we have to say that's the base case, uh, then we're focusing on, on how the, the, this very important Chinese economic machine is directing itself at the rest of Asia, the Middle East, and Africa, which, which are our core markets. If you look at your different revenue stream, so you have dominant posi position in uh, transaction banking, where mm -hmm. you're doing very well, but That's you're right. seeing a lot of entrants actually wanting to, to, to kind of you know, be part of that. How do you maintain clients and, ga and gain market position? I think the reason we've been gaining market share in transaction banking, so in cash management, yeah. in cross-border trade, in financial markets, <clears throat> these areas are, are core to us. They've been growing quite healthily. Uh, and the reason that, that, that people come to us is because of our global network. Uh, so it's impossible to replicate. I, I, I think that no one has tried to replicate a network that was something like Standard Chartered's across Africa, across the Middle East, South Asia, Asia, uh, North Asia, with important nodes in Europe and in, in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, that, that network is a true, true differentiator. And we've really focused a lot for the past three years on how we can make that network available to existing clients, but also new clients. Right. Uh, and, it, and it has led to increasing market share and improving profits. And this is what clients want. What do clients ask you the most? Well, right now, clients ask us the most is what's going to happen with U.S. and China, uh, exactly where we started. But uh, what, 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 uh, what our clients value most is the fact that we can provide a global level service, so international quality in some uh, small markets uh, or more difficult to access markets in Africa or in South Asia or, or across ASEAN. Uh, and that, that's what differentiates us. But interestingly, once we have the relationship with the clients, mm -hmm. uh, then they're perfectly happy to deal with us in, in China or India or Hong Kong or Singapore 
or to the U.S. or, or Brazil. Uh, so uh, where, where there's plenty of banking alternatives to, to Standard Chartered Bank. Uh, so we, we feel like we're in a pretty good spot, and we're going to yeah. continue to push that. Do, do your client, you know, because they worry about the trade tensions, do they invest less? Do they want more cash? How is their behavior it's changing? A we see a different kind of investment. So okay. there's clearly investment in diversifying supply chains. Right. Uh, I think everybody's aware now that, that you don't want to be too dependent on one supplier for anything. Uh, and that's American and European companies, but it's also Asian companies, it's Korean companies, it's Japanese companies. Uh, and that's, uh, so that they're still investing, but they're investing in different ways. And, uh, but uh, broadly, I think uh, discretionary investment has, has reduced. Uh, anxieties are higher and, and, and people just pull back a little bit. Um, and, uh, and I'm afraid that's going to carry on for some time. But a pullback a little bit is how much, like 10% or, or do, do you see actually, you know, well, what could be the catalyst for more anxiousness from clients? Well, I think the, with each further ratcheting of, uh, of trade tensions, we're seeing two things happen. One is the immediate impact on, on global equity markets. Yeah. And, and Which is growth. muted, isn't it? Muted, but it's you know, given the underlying strength of, of corporate earnings so far right. and, and the strength of the U.S. economy, I, I see it, 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 you feel it in equity markets. Mm -hmm. And we saw in the fourth quarter just how, how uh, substantial that can be if concerns are very high. Uh, so I think there's a more balanced approach right now. There's still hope that uh, whether it comes out of the Tokyo summit or, or something else, so that we can have a breakthrough. Uh, I, I'm not counting on it, uh, but, but there is some hope. And uh, yeah, but I think, I think the equity markets are, are reflecting some, but not a huge amount of anxiety right this, right this moment. Uh, but then the, the, the second order effect is, is what we see on, uh, on a, a investment capex. And what we're, when we look at global economic activity, you're seeing a, a steady downward pressure on, on capex. Uh, Which is what being, chief executives being too nervous to invest. Just say, let's just wait a little bit. Right. Let's just hold off. Let's see how things develop. And, uh, but the, the flip side, which is the consumer, has still remained pretty robust. So it's, it's been a good ongoing engine. But a consumer is often a lagging indicator, whereas CapEx tends to be a leading indicator. I mean, could you have a recessionary environment where the consumer is still strong, but because of a lack of investments, it's kind of like a downward spiral? Well, I think we often do. Have, I think that's, that often is the, the, the cycle. And uh, corporate confidence wanes earlier than, than consumer confidence. And look, this is, this is a negative scenario. I don't think it's prescribed. It's not necessary. This can be avoided. Right? The, uh, there, there's a trade deal to be done. Uh, I, I have to think that there's a, a, a technology and security deal that can be done that can give countries confidence. Obviously, it's a controversial matter between the U.S. and, and, and some of the U.S. allies uh, who are taking different views on, on things like Huawei. Uh, so, but th th there, there do appear to be deals that could be done. And let's really focus on how we can do something that, that accomplishes the objectives of, of opening up China, making sure that we've got a level playing field, uh, and, and doing it in a safe and sound way. But of course, we have to prepare for the other alternative, right. and, and we are. Where do you and, see and I think most corporations are. Where do you see opportunities, you know, country-wise, in in the next 24 months, 24 to 36 months? Yeah. So we continue to see see opportunities in China. Yeah. Uh, China really is continuing to open up. We we uh, got a license last year to be a, a local fund custodian. This is a big deal uh, for the first foreign bank to have that. And so we're going to invest heavily in that business. Mm -hmm. the, the the rules in China have changed. We can take a, a higher ownership in securities companies. Uh, we could take a higher ownership in banks as well, although we, we own 100% of our bank today, so I feel com quite comfortable with, uh, with that position. Uh, so China is, is ongoing. Uh, we've invested very heavily in, in digital in, across Africa. So we've now rolled out uh, digital banks in nine countries in Africa. We'll do one more uh, over the course of this year. Uh, we'll roll out that capability in, uh, in the Middle East and mm -hmm. South Asia. Um, the uh, Singapore and that continues. That makes a difference. I mean, how, if you roll out technology, how fast do you get the returns? It, it, individually, uh, each of the uh, the African market investments is uh, not very material in terms of our expected bottom line. So as we fully ramp these okay. things up over a couple of years, uh, what we're trying to do though is, is to position Standard Chartered as the leading bank. Uh, both from a, from a customer service and quality perspective, but increasingly in terms of market share in these markets, which themselves are growing quite quickly. Right. And but this is what, brand recognition? No, it's, 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 it's new customers. Right. Uh, it is some brand recognition. It's also be, being identified uh, with individuals and small businesses as a bank that is innovative. And uh, so as we go and talk to our corporate customers about things that we can do together, they say, oh yeah, we want to deal with a bank that, that, that is able to help us innovate. Uh, by being innovative themselves. So uh, there's some branding, there's some new customers, and we, we, want, we want many, many, many more customers and clients 
in these markets. And, and the best and most effective way to do that is through the digital channel. But how will that change? I mean, are, are we, you know, if you look at the, f the pace of change in the digital channel in the last five years, is it going to double in, in the next five years? And how can you stay ahead of that? Yeah, look, our, our, our uh, digital penetration rates on average across our markets is still only about 50%, right? So you know, half of our clients, uh, these are our existing clients, are, uh, are not access, accessing us through a digital channel. Mm -hmm. That's kind of consistent with, with the, the, glo the global banking benchmarks. Uh, the, the, the gain from here will get the 50% much closer to 100%, and clearly as the, the demographics will pull us that way, yeah. but also to take the billions of people who are unbanked today uh, or underbanked today and bring them on board through a digital channel. Uh, these, these could be people in remote locations or, or people that, uh, that will have their first savings in their, in their yeah. lives, they'll have their first smart, smartphone, right. uh, and they'll access the financial markets through that mechanism in a way that they couldn't before. Are we going to see M&A in Europe anytime soon, and does that impact actually how, how you see the world? Uh, well, it doesn't change our view of the world too much. Uh, we should have M&A in Europe, in, in the banking, you're talking in the in banking, banking sector. In banking industry. It, it's, uh, yeah, the, 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 the European banking sector is, is, uh, is uh, is over dispersed. It's, it's too fragmented, and uh, and clearly one way forward is is to combine. Uh, I don't think that's a, a field in which we will necessarily Quite. play, uh, yeah. given our focus on Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. But it's uh, we are a European bank, both by domicile and by regulation, well, mm -hmm. UK bank. So we'll call it European for the time being, and um, and that's uh, uh, so. So we see you know, very close at hand uh, how fragmented the European banking market is, and, and how much opportunity there is for better customer service through consolidation. 